Hey, good morning. Uh, we are discussing about physics first course. In the last uh, lecture, we discussed about uh, we ended at Young's double slit experiment. If you remember, uh, this is the classic experiment which revealed the wave nature of light. Now in this experiment, we have a light source and uh, there is this uh, double slit arrangement, slit S1 and slit S2. Uh, the light is emitted, which is uh, a monochromatic light source basically. So light is emitted from this source and it passes through the double slit arrangement. Now these two uh, openings, these are very narrow openings and the distance between them is also very small. So what happens when the light passes through these two points, uh, these two points behave like a coherent uh, show, uh, uh, like coherent sources of light. So both of them are having a cylindrical uh, wave front. Now the light, uh, after passing through this double slit arrangement, light is incident on this screen. Now what happens at, the, at any point on the screen? What happens? Uh, there will be a superposition of two coherent light waves, and as a result of that, there will be a redistribution of intensity. If you remember the definition of interference, it says that if you have a superposition of uh, two same frequency or two coherent waves, then there will be redistribution of intensity, and that redistribution of intensity will take place on the screen at various points. Okay, so what we'll do, we'll consider a point on the screen, and that point, uh, at that point, we'll calculate the power difference between the uh, originating point and the point on the screen, so we will calculate the part difference between uh, the two waves or the two waves which are traveling from the shores S1 and S2 and they are reaching to a common point on the screen. So we will calculate the part difference and then see which condition will be satisfied there, whether it is maxima or minima. Okay. So now to do that, we consider this diagram. Now this diagram, anyway, there is a, a small error data diagram, anyway, these lines are basically straight lines. Okay. So just because of this coming, uh, there is a problem. So what we need to do here, now just need to understand the geometry first. Now in the geometry, uh, what we consider here, here anyway, uh, this is the shores and this is the double slit arrangement and this is the screen. Okay, so in the in the uh, in this case, we are just showing. So basically, your shores is over here, and these are the two slits. Remember, okay, so this is what we are having here. Now these two points S1 and S2 are basically your double slits and the distance between them is D. D is very small, remember? Now what we do, we want to calculate the power difference between now one wave which is travelling from the point S1 to P Another wave is traveling or starting from point S2 and reaching to the point P. Now P is any random point. Now uh, uh, for this uh, analysis we are considering that the P is a point at X distance from the center. Okay. Now this center means this S1O and S2O are same basically. It means it is a center point and we are talking about at, at as an x distance from the point O. So what we will consider or what we will find here that what, what kind of intensity pattern will be there after the superposition whether it will be a bright uh, point or it will be a, a dark point. So for that what we need to calculate we want to calculate the power difference and that is basically S2P minus S1P. Remember both the waves are travelling in the same medium. So, whatever medium you are considering anyway, in general in the experimental setup it was originally the air medium. So, the refractive index is 1 for both the cases. So, we are not, so the geometrical part difference is, uh, geometrical part difference is equal to the optical part difference. Okay. Now, for calculating this term basically S2P minus S1P, we will use some uh, trigonometry here. So, for that purpose what we do here, or, uh, we we'll consider a triangle, uh, this triangle now, so triangle S1, P and E, fine. Now in 
that, what we consider here is basically something like this. You have a situation is E as one and B. Now this as one E is a distance D, capital D, and this distance is your x minus. Why d by 2? Because OE equals to d by 2 and OF equals to d by 2. Okay, you can write it here. OE equals to OF equals to d by 2. So this distance is your x minus d by 2. Now according to, uh, this is a right angle triangle. So S1 P whole square is equals to d square plus x minus d by 2. Okay. Now similarly what we do, we consider another triangle as 2 P F. Now in this again, uh, what we have here, if I just redraw the triangle here, this is something what we have here. This is X plus T by 2, this is S2, this is P and this is F. Okay? Now this is D by 2 and this is X. So this is X by X plus D by 2. Fine? Now what we have, uh, we have, and this is again capital D here, so this becomes D square plus X plus D by 2 whole square. Okay, now using these two, we may write now, as 2 P whole square minus plus 1 p whole square which is basically t2 square plus x plus d by 2 whole square minus d square plus x minus d by 2 whole square now if i open this this becomes d square plus x square plus 2 x d by 2 minus d square Sorry, there is one more term plus d square by 4 minus d square minus x square minus d square by 4 and plus 2x by 2. Okay? Now, from this, what I must be is. is and this gets cancelled and this becomes and this is also so this is 2xt fine so as 2p square minus as 1p square equals to 2xt now we can write this as a because this is a square minus b square so i can write this as 2p minus as 1p and as 2p plus as 1p equals to twice of x into d or I can say s2p minus s1p is equals to twice of xd divided by s2p plus s1p now remember this s2p equals to we can consider as 1 p plus as 2 p almost equal to twice of t. Okay? So in this case, as 2 p minus as 1 p equals to twice of x d divided by twice of d approximately. Okay? So this gives you x d by d. It, this is the power difference. So this is the final result. Using some geometry, we could calculate that what is the part difference here between the two waves which are reaching to the point P. Now, this is the part difference. Okay, fine. Now, as you know, when this part difference is equals to integer multiple of the wavelength, okay, then this is a bright point. If this part difference is twice, twice or twice, twice m plus one into the by 2 again m is an integer here then this point is a dark point so this, these are the two conditions anyway now you remember x is more distance of the point from the uh, 
center to the location then we have D D is the distance between the two slates and capital D is the distance between the double slit and the screen here ok so these are the two conditions for the maxima and minima in the Young's double slit and minima ok so you, by, uh, by keeping uh, putting the value facts you can find out that what kind of a uh, fringe will be observed there ok now if you want to calculate the width of a particular fringe ok now for that purpose what we do we calculate the width of fringe so we consider two consecutive fringes M fringe so we assume that axon is the location of and axon plus one is the location of n plus one. So what we have? Accent. Now, according to our uh, equals to and lambda is for right. So what we are considering here x and d over capital D equals to and lambda and x and plus one d over capital D equals to and plus one lambda. Fine. Now we calculate the value of beta which is fringe width and which is x m plus 1 you should write it from the top so beta which is x m plus 1 minus x m and from this we can calculate the values ok which is like this anyway which is written here and here x m will be m lambda small d over uh, xm will be m lambda capital D over small d and xm plus 1 will be like this okay so when you subtract this you obtain finally that the fringe width beta is equals to lambda d over d okay so this is the expression for the fringe width now remember lambda is the wavelength of the monochromatic light d is the distance between double slit and screen and small d is the distance between the two slits. Now, if I see here the beta, the fringe width is proportional to. So beta is proportional to lambda. Beta is proportional to capital D, and beta is inversely proportional to one by d. So if you want to have very clear fringes, if you want to have very clear fringes, then what do you need? You need to have I have value of the wavelength anyway, but anyway, in a single experimental setup, you have a lambda constant. Uh, you can keep your screen very far. So, if you keep your screen very far, you will have uh, clear, distinct fringes. And if the distance between the two slits, d is small d, uh, which is the distance between the two slits in the double slit case, uh, this is. So, this, this distance is basically small d. So, if you keep this distance, distance as small as possible the fringes will be more clear ok so this is what is a representation now again uh, in the diagram it is shown that how the maxima and minima would be observed now what we are seeing here these are your s1 and s2 and this is your center point anyway and the center point is having a, uh, a situation which is uh, dark uh, which is a bright point here because the part difference becomes zero anyway and it satisfies the condition of brightness here then this is the first dark frame bright dark bright ok so alternatively you have for different values anyway for m equals to 0 1 2 so this is basically m lambda and this is the case 2 m plus 1 lambda by 2 so wherever uh, these conditions are met you find uh, bright fringes and dark fringes ok so this is next to that Coherence. Now, when I say coherent light sources, uh, there are some practical uh, things which you should know before uh, reaching to a conclusion that how we can produce the coherent uh, 
uh, uh, sources and what, which sources would be coherent in nature. Now, in general, when you look at a light source, light source is mostly producing light in an atomic. So, when you see an atomic process, what happens? An atom uh, changes its state from higher energy state to the lower energy state. So, when an atom moves from a higher energy state to a lower energy state, it releases some photons. And those photons are basically, because in, cert in certain uh, atomic systems, what happens? The, the, the energy difference between higher atomic level and lower atomic level is equal to uh, the energy which corresponds to the visible wavelength. Okay, so you have a value of lambda which corresponds to visible and then you see the light. Now what happens, uh, there are billions of atoms in a very small amount of material. So what happens, all maybe it's, it's a random process and many atoms are simultaneously doing, making a transition from lower to uh, higher to lower and then there will be a variety of pulses generated. Okay, now because of the superposition of all these pulses, you have a, uh, a light, which is uninterrupted light basically. Now when you look at the wave pattern, basically this is kind of a uh, impulse a particular atom will generate. Okay, so it, 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 when it jumps from higher energy state to the lower energy state, there will be a pulse, there will be another pulse, there will be another pulse, and so on and so on. Okay, now at the same time there are other atoms which are doing the same process, and then finally what we do anyway, or what we see, at a particular instant, you will see that there are many, many thousands of atoms are making transition from uh, higher to lower. So all these light pulses will be superimposed and you will see a uh, resultant light basically. So what happens when they superimpose, uh, this kind of a pattern would be generated. Now what you are seeing here, this, this wave is not complete at this reason anyway. There is a very small gap which is basically known as a phase back. Okay. So what you are finding here, that the wave is complete anyway, it has a sinusoidal character up to this point, then there is a small gap because when they are joining together, you have a group of pulses and they generate this particular segment, you have another group of pulses that generate this segment and when at this particular time, they are basically joined together and there is always a discontinuity. Okay. So continuity breaks here and this is known as a phase break. And these, these breaks are very very small in nature because this is this is kind of a wave group, this is again another wave group. And there is a break in between. So what we have, we always have these kind of phase breaks in <coughs> light which is generated by an atomic source. Now, up to this point anyway, it is perfectly sinusoidal. Here there is a small discontinuity. Again up to this point it is a continuous or it is it's, it's perfect sinusoidal and so on and so. So we characterize, now this kind of breaks are not allowed for the coherent sources anyway. So this shows anyway, whatever shows we are considering here is basically coherent for this range only. So we use two particular terms, coherence time and coherence length to characterize various light sources. Okay? Now what is coherence time basically? This is an average time during which the wave remains perfectly sinusoidal or you can completely describe its phase because at this particular point anyway there is an ambiguity in the uh, phase of this wave chain so what we do here we we can only describe its phase for this particular length okay so when you consider this length anyway the length over which the wave is perfectly sinusoidal that is known as coherence length and the corresponding time is known as coherence time, the time over which the wave remains completely sinusoidal. Okay? So these are the two things which you need to remember. And if you look at the order of the time anyway, sometimes that is to power minus 40 seconds also. Okay? So in certain cases, and for the sodium lamp anyway, it is order of second anyway. So that's why we consider sodium lamp in the laboratory or we use sodium lamp in the laboratory as a uh, light source to see the interference pattern and to generate the coherence shows. Fine. Now next to that, uh, this is very important anyway as far as the laboratory is concerned and as far as our understanding about the interference is concerned. So the first topic is condition for the sustained interference. Okay. 
Now, how interference will be sustained? Because what do you mean by sustained interference? Because when an interference is taking place, it should be sustained for a long time so that you can clearly observe the fringes. Okay, if you cannot observe the fringes, you will see that the interference is not taking place. So, for a sustained interference pattern, you need to have these conditions to be satisfied. Anyway, these are very simple. Uh, if you understand the coherent, then you will completely understand uh, uh, these points anyway. The waves from the two sources must be of the same frequency because the, the coherence condition requires that the frequency should be same. If the frequencies are different, they will not be coherent sources. The second says that the two light waves must be coherent, of course. Coherent means their phase should be completely determined. Okay? There should be there may be a phase difference, but that phase difference should remain constant over the time. Okay? So the phase relation should could, could be uh, a fix. Now the part difference must be less than the coherence length. Now this is very very important because when you are talking about the part difference, now if the wave is traveling from one point to another point, now uh, suppose you talk about a source here, a point here, so this is S1 here, S2 here. Now the part difference is this uh, distance basically. So you are talking about S2P minus S1P. Now this part difference should be always less than the coherence length. Now the reason is because the coherence length is a length over which the wave pulse is completely sinusoidal. Means its phase is completely defined. Now if this part difference exceeds the coherence length, it means there would be a phase break in between. And if the phase break comes in between, then the frequency changes anyway. There will be a relationship the phase relationship will break and they will not remain coherent. Okay, so the condition of coherence at this point will be satisfied only when the part difference is always less than the coherence. So this is very very important at this point. In the coherence, uh, the part difference should be always less than the coherence plan. So you should make your arrangement in such a way that the part difference created between the two light waves which are reaching to a common point should be less than the coherence line. And if the waves are plane polarized, okay, now uh, this is important anyway and this you will understand when we will discuss the polarization. If the light source which you are using is a, is a polarized light source and it is producing a plane polarized light, then the, 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 the plane of polarization, because when you talk about plane polarized light and there is a plane which defined which is defined for that particular polarized light so their plane of polarization should be same now this is uh, this polarization concept you will understand when I will teach you the polarization but right now you can just uh, consider this point here that if the light is plane polarized uh, then both the sources should have same plane of polarization so these are the things which are required to see the pattern clearly or to see or to observe the pattern. Now there are certain more thing, uh, conditions which are written here, conditions for the formation of distinct fringes. Now if you want to see the fringes clearly, means the fringes are very thick in, in size so that you can clearly observe or your eyes can clearly distinct them. If you want to see that, okay, this is a bright fringe, this is a dark fringe, this is a bright fringe. So the pattern is clearly visible to you and this will only happen when you use two coherent sources which are very near to each other. Okay, now if you remember beta, beta is lambda d over d. So if d is small, now two coherent sources must lie close to each other. So this condition say d is very small. And if d is very small, this beta is large. And beta large means the thickness of the fringes produced due to the interference is large. So it means they are very clear. The distance of the screen from the two sources must be large. So this condition says D is large. And if I say D is large, beta is again large. So if you have a situation that the screen is kept at a very large distance from the two slits, then the beta would be large and the fringes would be more clear. Okay, and the vector sum of the overlapping electric field. Now, when I say coherent sources, and if the electric fields are even and into, if 
if you remember if the amplitudes are even and equal then the resultant amplitude would be e1 plus e2 for the bright case and for the dark case it would be e1 minus e2 now if these two are nearly identical if they are same then it, this is the best option if they are same then what happens this would be twice of e and this would be zero it means the dark region would be come having zero intensity and the bright region would be having maximum intensity because amplitude square is the intensity so if if this is if i say intensity then this is square and this is square so zero square would be zero so it is always very good if i consider the two covariant sources of same amplitude or if it is not possible you can consider nearly same amplitude so the pattern would be clearly visible because dark would be the minimum the minimum possible value is zero so if you have two same amplitude waves then the minimum would be zero intensity and then maximum so the vector sum of the overlapping chaotic field vectors must be zero in the dark region so this is there then you will have clear thick fringes and then very distinct fringe pattern on the screen and you will be able to observe them very clear fine next to that now how we can produce the covariant sources because as i say that most of the sources most of the light sources are having atomic phenomena and due to that atomic process it, which is random process you will always have a phase break in between and because of that the coherence is broken basically so to produce the covariant waves anyway what we do we use an arrangement anyway because two independent sources cannot be coherent the reason is very clear because uh, this is a random process and all the all the atoms which are not in conditions from higher energy level to the lower energy level will will be released in a different phase so because of that anyway the phase relationship cannot be defined or the phase relationship would not be a constant or a fixed phase relationship and the light wave will not be coherent if they are generated from two independent light sources so for that purpose what we use we use a common or a single light source and we use some mechanism to produce two coherent sources from the single light source and these are the two techniques available wavefront splitting and amplitude splitting okay now the wavefront splitting is very simple as we did in the earlier case of the double slit experiment this is what is known as a wavefront splitting basically because when the light is is passing through this slit and anyway this is now a single spherical suppose if it is a hole a single pin hole then it is basically a spherical wave front so the light is having a spherical wave front and then again it is allowed to pass through two holes basically so this single wave front is now divided into two spherical wave front so this these two holes behave like two independent sources and these two are at the same distance from the source so this distance and this distance is same so the light originating from this point because when you see from that side you will see that the light is coming from the source as two and coming from the source as one independently so at these two points the, the light wave which is generated will be in the same phase so they will satisfy the condition of coherence so this is uh, this is production of coherent sources using the wavefront splitting now as you know if i the second technique which is amplitude splitting in this case what we do here we use a transparent medium and the light is allowed to fall on that what happens if the light ray falls on this some portion will be reflected and some portion will be refracted Of the medium anyway what is the reflection coefficient what is the amount of reflection here which depends on the 
reflective indexes of the two medium. So this is another technique which is known as amplitude division. So by using wavefront division, uh, wavefront division or wavefront splitting and amplitude splitting, we can produce the coordinate choices. Okay. Now I just give you the names. Young's Velocity experiment, as I mentioned, is an example of wavefront splitting. Fresnel bias is also uh, the example of wavefront splitting. On the other hand, you have amplitude splitting or amplitude division in the interference in the thin film, film, which we will also see, and even Newton's ring experiment and Michelson interferometer, which belongs to this category of amplitude splitting. Okay. So now in the next part, we'll see how interference pattern is produced with the help of rational libraries, how we can determine the wavelength of a uh, unknown wavelength of a, a given source using the rational libraries. Then we will discuss about interference and uh, interference through the Michelson interferometer and Newton's ring. Okay. Now, coming to the Fresnel libraries. Now, Fresnel libraries is a device which is used uh, to produce two coherent sources uh, and then see the interference pattern as a result of the superposition of light produced through that coherent. Now, this is uh, a, a pictorial view of a of Fresnel Vibris many it's a broad triangle has been drawn here, but this is not as broad anyway. It, it looks, if you look at a Fresnel Vibris, it is very uh, similar to a thin glass plate. Anyway. So what we do here, the reflecting angles are very very small here. You can just uh, monitor here. This is 30 minutes anyway, so half degree. This is half degree angle and the remaining 179 degree angle on one side. So basically, you have a glass plate. And what you do here, you just melt a polish to this side anyway. So you have a situation like this. So you just polish this surface, polish this surface and this remains here. So this becomes 179 degree and this becomes half degree. This becomes half Or you can consider this as a, a two prism, two separate prisms kept in such a way that they, their bases are together anyway. So this can be considered as two independent prism. Now this the middle diagram is showing you anyway. Suppose you have a light source here and if you keep a prism in between, as you know anyway, I have explained in the in the in the, in the dispersion uh, definition of dispersion anyway or how the dispersion takes place. So the light where this is incident direction, the light passes through the prism anyway, so it, it bends slightly and then it goes in this direction finally when it comes out from the prism. And if you if you just accent this direction and find out the angle, this angle is known as angle of minimum deviation. So whenever a light ray passes through the prism, always there will be a deflection in the direction of the outgoing uh, ray. Now what we do here, uh, the same concept will be used to understand how uh, two coordinate light sources will be generated with the help of Fresnel bias. Okay. Now this is a diagram here anyway. Now this is a Fresnel bias we have kept here. This is the plane surface and these are the uh, inclined surfaces anyway. So this is basically uh, you can divide this into two different prisms. Okay. This is one prism, this is another prism and this is your source here. Now when the light is emitted from the source, the light ray is going something like this. Now this doesn't go in this direction. What happens? There will be a banding and the light ray is now going in this direction. Similarly, when the light rays are incident on this portion, again there is a banding and light goes. Okay? Now this is the reason. Now you have, suppose you are considering these two uh, light rays anyway. So what's happening here? This light is going in this direction, this light ray is going in this direction. So this is the reason of overlapping between the two. Now what's happening anyway, if I just extend these in the back direction, what do you see here? That you see, if you are seeing from this side anyway, if you stand here and you just try to see, or just try to understand that where this light is coming from, then you will just see that the light rays are coming from the shoes and if you look, if you concentrate on the, the upper half of the bypass. If you concentrate on the lower half of the bypass, then you will see that the light, you will feel that the light is coming from this second source. Okay? So these are the two virtual sources basically. If you see from this side of the bypass, then you see that okay, there are two sources which are emitting the lights and this is the reason of the overlapping basically. So the light rays coming from the sources S1 and S2 which 
which are basically virtual sources. Originally, the light is coming from the signal source, but with the help of these batteries, we could divide them into two different parts anyway, or we could we could we could we could divide this particular source as a two coherent sources. And what we are observing here, we are observing here the region of overlapping. And in this region of overlapping, what you will observe, you will observe that the intensity pattern or the fringes will be observed, the maxima, minima, maxima, minima, maxima, minima. And these are known as the interference fringes anyway. And if you look on the screen anyway, if you keep a screen here or if you keep an eye, uh, eyepiece here through which you can observe, then you will clearly see that there will be a dark fringe, a straight lines anyway, a dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, bright. This kind of pattern will be observed here. Anyway. And this beta is basically the fringe width anyway. Uh, now, if you look at the geometry, if you remember the lens double slit experiment, the capital D is the distance between the two sources and the screen. Because the theory remains same here, again the same formula beta equals to lambda d by d is applicable. Because this is the wavefront discrete in case, and the, the result is same anyway, the beta which will be produced through this, this setup will be following the same rule anyway. Now here the capital D is the distance between the two sources and the screen anyway. Now where are the two sources kept in this case? These are the, which are virtual basically, but these are the, uh, this is the location of the two sources and this is the location of your screen, so this is the distance D. Okay? Now to be more clear anyway, because to utilize the geometry and when you do the experiment, you use this measurement anyway, which is the distance between the two sources and A, which is not known because these sources are not actually present in your experimental setup. These are the virtual sources. So this is small a, which is the distance between the bypass and virtual sources, and this is B, which is the distance between bypass and screen, which, which you can measure through the experimental setup. So to find out the capital D, to find out capital D, you need to know the value of A. Because capital D is your A plus B. And this is known and this is not known. So we will determine this, this small a with the help of experimental setup. Okay? And the next slide. So this is how the interference A pattern is produced using the uh, Fresnel batteries. Now we will move on to the next, how we can determine wavelength of a given source. Now for that purpose anyway what we do, because you remember beta equals to lambda d by d. Or we can use the same explanation for beta d by k. Okay. Now this d can be measured from the experiment. This small d we will understand how to determine and beta can be measured with the with the help of uh, resultant interference pattern anyway. So what we do here, we find out as I, as, I, as it is mentioned in the last week, suppose if you observe the fringe pattern, then what you do here, you keep your crosswire on the one of the bright fringe and take the measurement on the, the measuring screw. Then you move it, you move the crosswire and set it on the next fringe. You move it on to the next, next, next. Okay, so you consecutively you take observation on the consecutive fringes and you one, two, three, four, five, six, and then we take the difference of any two and just find out that what is the weight of a, a single fringe. So this can be done. Now capital D for, for that particular settings for which you are observing the fringe weight, you will also measure what is the value of B basically. B which is the distance between Fresnel batteries and the screen. So B is known, beta is known anyway. So D which is A plus B. Now what is the value of this A which we need to understand? Beta is already there, so beta is there, small d we need to determine, so this is mentioned here. Now for, to determine the value of small d, what we do? Small d is basically the distance between the two sources and they are virtual basically in case of Fresnel like this, so uh, we need to use certain technique to find out the distance between S1 and S2. And for that purpose what we do here, for that purpose we, we insert a convex lens in between the bypass and the screen. Okay? Now when we insert a convex lens and then we keep this convex lens near the bypass and then move it and see through the eyepiece. What you observe at a particular location when the focus is complete you will see two clear lines. Two slits like this, two vertical lines in your eyepiece. So you keep your 
convex or you fix your convex lens at that point and then measure the distance u anyway and that distance is between your shores which is the actual shores so this is u and this is v now this is from the geometrical optics anyway u is the distance between lens and the object v is the distance between the uh, lens and the screen basically so u and v and according to the rule and, and what you do here through the eyepiece micrometer screw you measure the distance between the two lines which you are observing in the micrometer screw so you keep your crosswire here first take the observation again you set the crosswire to the next lead and then take the difference of the two which is d so if i find it out then v by u is following this rule d1 by d d is the actual distance between the sources and d1 is at that particular set now what we do here now we move convex lens near to the micrometer eyepiece and then again we will find that for a particular case or for a particular location of the convex lens you find again that these two lines are clearly observed and again you find the distance between them and that distance is now d2 anyway this is not very clear to you so this distance is d2 again this is v this is u and it follows that now if we multiply these two anyway we find that d is square root of t1 d2 by multiplying this two anyway u and v will cancel out and there will one there will be one on the left side and then this will be d1 d2 divided by d square so d gives you d1 by d2 so by raising the values of d1 and d2 for these two settings we can find out the value of d small d so now in this expression we have a value of small d we have value of beta which comes from the measurement of the fringe width and then capital e now you require the value of now there is another way uh, you remember the, the, the distance of yeah a is the distance between the shores and your bypass okay so this a is again known so you can calculate the value of uh, a plus b which is capital g so by putting all these values in the expression we can find out the value of so this is how we can determine the value of wavelength. Now there is an alternate way. If you don't want to use this convex lens technique to determine the value of small d, you can use alternatively this formula. And this formula comes from the uh, angle of deviation uh, treatment anyway. So this is basically twice of a mu minus one into alpha. And this alpha is basically is by this angle. This alpha is 1 by 2 basically. In most of the cases anyway, if it is different then you will use the, that value. So alpha is, now here you will use it in 3D and you will remember this is not in degree. So plug in the value of alpha in radians. This mu is the refractive index of your bipris material. This a is the distance between bipris and the shores. And then keep put all these values here on the right hand side, you will obtain the value of the small d. So either of these two expressions you can use to determine the value of the small d. And then substitute the values, you will obtain the value of wavelength of the light shows. So this is how we use Prasma practice to determine the value of the wavelength of an unknown source. Now you will, you will do an experiment of this rational bypass in your laboratory session. So you will understand it completely when you will see the hands-on, uh, when you will do the hands-on practice on the experimental setup. You can change the distance between eyepiece and the screen, you can even change the distance between the shores and the bypass. And you can play with that and you can understand that how the fringe width changes if you change the capital D, if you change the uh, other parameter of the experimental setup. Okay. Now this is another uh, application of Rathna batteries, which is determination of a thick, uh, thickness of a very thin sheet. Now suppose if you have a very thin sheet of some medium, some transparent medium, and if you want to know that what is the size of that, uh, what is the thickness of that film, which you cannot uh, precisely determine with the help of other experiments or other instrument, then you can use interference or uh, personal batteries to determine that. Now what we do here, now before understanding this experimental setup, what you need to understand
Now, if I instead of using a monochromatic shores in the fragile pipe based experiment here, instead of using a monochromatic light source, monochromatic light source means a single wavelength light source. If I use a white light over here, what happens? Because as you know, white light is a mixture of seven different wavelengths. So what will happen? All these sub, this, 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 these seven colors of these different wavelengths will travel in different different direction because because of the dispersion. And what will happen there? All the regions would be different. But at the center of this screen, which is exactly in front of your shorts, what you will find that all the light rays, all those wavelengths will be again overlapping at the same point. So you will see again an overlapping between the seven different colors and you will see a white fridge there. Then in the remaining region you will see that the variety of colors are there. So basically red pattern will have its own fringe pattern, uh, yellow color will have its own fringe pattern, blue color will have its own red pattern and all those patterns will be overlapping on the screen. So as a result of that overlapping, at the center you will find a white fringe. And in the remaining region you will see various color fringes and then Later on you will see a complete illuminating white region and everywhere no clear pattern is visible. Now what is the purpose of using white light shores for the bar with the batteries? We just want to concentrate on the center frame because if I use a monochromatic light shores, I cannot find that which one is the center fringe here because all the fringes are same. So I cannot clearly uh, this thing will clearly find out that which fringe is the central fringe. So for finding the central fringe, what we do? We use a white light source and the only fringe, the only white fringe which we find on the screen is basically the central fringe. Fine? Now, so using the white light here. Now, suppose you have you have the same setup. So you have S1 and S2 which are virtual light sources produced through the Fresnel batteries and you have a center point on the screen. Now what I am doing here, I am using a white light source and I see what is on the screen, what I see on the screen, I see a white fringe on the screen. So I take the measurement at what location that white fringe is observed. Okay? Because at that point the, the, the part difference is zero. Because S1P, S1O and S2O are same at the point. So you will see that the white fringe is observed here. So I will mark, I will measure the location of that white fringe through the micrometer screw. Then what I do here, in one of the, in the path of one of the ray, I insert that small thin plate of transparent medium. Now this is very thin, the thickness is, like the thickness is T. So small T is the thickness of the light, which is inserted in between one of the in the path of one of the light rays, okay, either S1, the light ray which is originated from the S1 or light ray which is coming through the S2. So we insert that and now we do the recalibration. Now what happens because of the insertion of this uh, thin plate, the part difference will change. Now what will happen, the, the, the bright fringe which was at the center now will change its location and will shift to some other point. Now suppose if that point is P. So this is the point where now the white fringe, the white, the center fringe produced due to the bias is shifted to a point P. Now at this point now, because because of the insertion of this uh, thin plate in between the part, the part difference is changed for this particular light ray. And that part difference will, because the, the, the fringe will be observed at the location where the part difference is seen. Okay, so this point will now shift to a new point which is, now suppose this distance is x because when I insert the, the thin film what, what I can do, I can see that how much the fringes I can measure how much the fringe is shifting from the earlier location so here I have a measurement for this location I will take the measurement from the, for the new location and I will observe the value of x basically or I will measure the value of x from the experimental setup okay? now what I do here, I do a small mathematical calculation here because what is this what is the path traveled by this way when it is reaching to the point s1 p basically now there is a small thickness so what i do here s1 p minus t which is traveling in the air plus a small distance this light ray is traveling in the medium of refractive index mu because the, if the refractive index of this thing thin uh, material is mu then the light ray which is 
originating from this point and reaching to the point P is traveling all the distance in air except the distance t. So what I do here, as soon P minus t into 1 plus mu into t is equals to as to p because this entire uh, distance, the, the, the wave is traveling in the air only. So this equals to this. Fine? Now according to Anyway, if I do just a slight adjustment, as to p minus s to p comes out to be mu minus 1 into t. Now, according to our knowledge, this is given by this formula. So, this can be replaced by x d by t mu minus 1 into t. Now, these values we can measure as, as I have explained in the earlier slide, and how we can measure the value of uh, small d and capital T from the experimental setup. And this x here is the distance measured through the experimental setup, how much the fringe is shifted from the earlier location. So if I use that value here and then do the adjustment, I can determine the value of t. So I have the knowledge of x, I have small d, I have mu, which is the different index of your uh, material of the thin plate and capital D is your distance between the screen and the value. So in this way, we can determine the thickness of a thin glass plate or thin material. This is how we use Fresnel batteries with white light to determine the thickness of a small light. Okay. Now we move on to the next topic: interference in the thin films. Now we have seen how we can we can we can obtain two coherent sources with the help of wavefront division. Okay. Now we discuss how we can obtain or how we can obtain two coherent sources with the help of amplitude division. So this is an example of amplitude division here. Now in the diagram what I have shown here is a small thin plate. Okay? This may be a glass plate, this may be any other medium other than air anyway. And this medium has a refractive index mu. Now here the example of the calculation has been done for the glass plate anyway. So imagine that this is a thin glass plate and the light ray which is incident on this glass plate. Now, as you remember anyway, every medium has its own reflection coefficient and reflection coefficient. And if I consider, because for one of the conditions, one of the uh, incidence condition anyway, the reflection coefficient is given by this formula anyway. If you remember mu1 minus, I used the same formula earlier, mu1 minus mu2 divided by uh, mu2, sorry, mu2 minus mu1 and mu2 plus mu1 like that. Okay, so this is what here, uh, one is the refractive index of this reason and uh, mu is the refractive index of this reason. So we can calculate the reflection, reflection coefficient for the glass plate mu minus 1 mu plus 1. And if I substitute the value of the refract, refract, refractive index here, it comes out to be 0 0.042. Means this is the value of the reflection coefficient. So if the energy of this incident ray is 100 percent, then some portion of this would be reflected and then we can determine from this particular value which is 4.2 percent. So 4.2 percent will go in the same medium as a reflected uh, reflected wave and the remaining will go in the same medium as a refract, refracted wave. So this is how. Now this wave again is reflected from the lower surface. Okay? So this out of this 96 percent again there will be a reflection of the 4 percent of the 96 percent and remaining will go to the will be out of the glass plate which is approximately 92 percent okay calculation is just a rough calculation to give you an idea so if 100 percent is incident on this surface 4 percent will go here 96 percent will come will travel through the glass plate and 4 percent of the 96 percent which is almost uh, sorry 4 percent of the 96 percent will be reflected from this point and then remaining will go in the uh, will pass through the glass plate which is approximately 92 percent okay now this this four percent I mean, almost the four percent will have a refraction here and will pass through that and then there will be a reflection now you know reflection is very very small here it is just a four percent reflection so very small intensity will go here and remaining will be reflected so when you see these two consecutive rays this is four percent this is almost uh, very near to the 4% and this 4% again when it goes here the successive, after the successive reflection what you will find that the remaining rays will have very small amplitude anyway or either uh, you cannot notice them but at least the two successive reflection reflected waves has 
identical energy or identical intensity there. Fine. So these two can be interfere and produce the interference pattern. So these two can behave like a two covalent light rays. Fine. Similarly, in the reflected or in the transmitted light also, the light coming or light. which is transmitted to the glass plate can behave like a coherent source. Okay? So we can have an interference pattern in the reflected light ray, we can have an interference pattern in the transmitted light. Okay? So these are the, uh, the two ways anyway. If I if I measure, if I keep a screen over here then I can see an interference pattern there. If I keep a screen over here then also I can observe the interference pattern. So this is uh, how we can produce interference uh, with the help of amplitude division. Okay. Now we will see the experimental setup uh, in the next class probably, which is basically interference. Uh, first, we will understand how we can produce the interference uh, with the reflected light. So we will do some mathematical calculation to find out uh, what is the part difference between the two consecutive reflected rays, and then we will see that uh, what is the formula, what are the various conditions for producing the dark fringe and bright fringe. Fine. Similarly. Uh, we will also see for the transmitted light and how, uh, what will be the, uh, the part difference between the uh, two consecutive reflected rays and how we can produce dark and bright fringes with the help of transmitted light. So thank you. We will continue with this uh, topic in the